Hello and welcome to this Religion and Diplomacy conversation uh, today with Professor Marco Ventura on the topic of religion and artificial intelligence. Uh, my name is Judd Bertsall. I serve as the director of the Transatlantic Policy Network on Religion and Diplomacy, the TPNRD, uh, a project ba based at uh, Georgetown University's Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, uh, and World Affairs. And it's a real pleasure for me to be joined in conversation today by my friend and frequent collaborator, uh, Marco Ventura. Uh, professor Ventura is Professor of Law and Religion at the University of Siena uh, and was for several years the director of the Center for Religious Studies at FBK, the Foundation Bruno Kessler in Trento, uh, Italy. And it was in the context of his uh, directorship there that he wrote this fantastic new report on religion uh, and artificial uh, intelligence. Uh, it's a fascinating report. I highly commend it uh, to all of you. Uh, it deals with this very interesting emerging interplay between religion and artificial uh, intelligence. And it also has some uh, real insights uh, into religion in general and also how um, uh, governments and other actors can be engaging with religious and, and belief actors. So it has a relevance um, uh, also beyond the field of, of artificial intelligence. Well, Marco, thank you so much uh, for joining me in conversation today. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm glad to be here with you and very, very glad for the interest you're taking in our work, which uh, this is the first thing to be said. It, it is not about uh, an individual piece of work. This was really a collective effort from all the multiple components of our center with different backgrounds, a lot of researchers um, working on uh, the concepts on the text, on the drafting, uh, and me I was just one of them. Well, thank you. Well, I've benefited over the years so much from your work and the work of, of your colleagues. Uh, thank you for it. Um, well, let's begin with, with your own story, if we can. Um, your academic background is in law and religion, canon law, church-state relations, and so on. You're a, a recognized expert uh, in those fields. Uh, how did you become interested in this nexus between artificial intelligence and religion? Well, um, I did my PhD on assisted, uh, on assisted reproduction at the University of Strasbourg in France. Uh, from a perspective of uh, law and religion, church and state, laicite, the secular state, and even religious laws, canon law, uh, Roman Catholic canon law in particular. Um, that was a time when for France and Italy, uh, the debate on uh, uh, abortion um, was still uh, very fresh and uh, where the debate on the regulation of um, uh, assisted reproduction would be seen as a continuation in terms of both the conflicts, the, 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 the ethical dilemmas, the, um, and politics uh, and politics as well. So evolution of uh, separation, laicite, collaboration of church and state. So technology to some extent was uh, uh, being seen in a continuum with the previous uh, uh, key issues of church and state and for me, that was a sort of uh, link uh, between uh, what in the late 80s uh, could be seen as the established patterns of conflict and therefore of, 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 of separation for those who found separation desirable. Um, and at the same time um, uh, of uh, what was uh, coming as a future, um, a future issues uh, which would be, as has been proven uh, afterwards, more and more um, technology-based. So I would really see, I would then move to working on biotechnologies. And so I, I, I uh, came to see uh, the digital um, uh, challenge and the digital divide as very much in continuity with that work of mine. So interestingly, sort of moving from the Take more sort of body, body related, uh, sexuality even, and reproduction related technology into a, a much more, um, br much broader and a more pervasive um, uh, uh, impact of, the, uh, of technologies in our everyday life and, and therefore in, in law and religion as well. Well, thank you. Let, let's um, get into the key terms uh, in the report. You talk uh, both about artificial intelligence and religion in very expansive ways, and in fact, go beyond religion itself to talk about religious and belief actors. 
so in the report and in, in your work, uh, how do you understand and use these terms, artificial intelligence and religious and belief actors? Uh, well, our um, choice uh, after uh, a, a lot of internal discussion and, and, and thanks mainly to the philosophers of, of the group, uh, was to really uh, work on very, very broad uh, definitions on, uh, um, on both dimensions. So, um, uh, you know, uh, artificial intelligence uh, is, is understood in, in the document as basically, you know, digital technologies, uh, digital technologies um, uh, instrumental to artificial uh, agents, uh, which, can then you know uh, go from uh, software, uh, software agents into um, more sort of embodied uh, agents like robots, and uh, and of course this would uh, uh, encompass uh, machine learning, uh, automated um, automated reasoning, for instance, and uh, machine translation, and but the the. We have tried to constantly convey in the document, I think it is as important to convey in the discussion that, of course, we need categories, we need levels, and AI uh, at this time is uh, an, an, an extremely uh, impacting one, uh, but we also need to be aware that these are just labels, so that, that there was really a strong uh, interest for already injecting in the document a sense of uh, the uh, precarious nature, inevitably precarious nature of, of, the, of labels and definitions. The same um, would apply, of course, to religion. We rather uh, adopt the terminology of religion or belief based on uh, our um, expertise on freedom of religion or belief. And again, uh, this was understood in extremely broad terms. Um, we live in a time when uh, religion and no religion uh, are to be understood in a continuum. A religion and spirituality can be seen as uh, friends and even uh, possibly for, for some as foes. We want to uh, fully include uh, in, in our uh, discussion um, atheists, agnostics, humanists, and at the same time, of course, we also want to understand the religious um, a field as extremely uh, complex and nuanced on both levels, on the level of uh, communities, groups, and even you know, organizations or sort of institutionalized religion, and at the level of individual or individuals and at the level of the mobility of both, again, collective and um, individual actors. Well, thank you. Those definitions are, are really helpful. Um, I, I'm guessing that when many religious and belief actors think about AI, their minds go immediately to um, ethical concerns about the usage of, of AI in general, and then perhaps particularly towards um, uh, activities of some governments to use AI to regulate or even suppress uh, re religious activity. Uh, in the report, you call for religious and belief actors to be engaged beyond simply the ethical dimensions and the human rights dimensions of, of AI. And I found it really helpful that you have presented these, these uh, three categories of, of AI in religion, religion in AI, and then even quite provocatively religion of AI. Uh, could you unpack um, these three relationships and how uh, religious and belief actors can be involved beyond simply the ethical reflection and human rights concerns. Yes, um, the, the three categories uh, form uh, what we uh, conceive as a triangle. Sometimes we say triangle, sometimes we say three-dimensional, uh, a three-dimensional conception of the interaction of religion or belief and uh, AI. And this is based on our previous uh, work on religion and innovation. In fact, uh, the three categories are based on a previous, again, broader conceptualization of the encounter of religion and innovation as again being uh, uh, possibly seen as uh, a triangular. Uh, and uh, now the... Um, uh, AI, in, um, AI in, in religion refers to how 
um, believers individually and uh, religious belief uh, communities and organizations understand and use AI. So it's AI in religion in this sense, uh, sort of internal, internal uh, work on AI from a religious perspective. Um, um, then uh, there's this more external dynamic, and of course, there's no, you know, the 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 boundaries are constantly shifting um, and very porous. But then you, you then you have our um, religions uh, again, uh, individually and collectively. Um, contribute to the uh, evolution of AI in society, in, 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 in the broader society, in the larger society. So what's, uh, what, what, what has been elaborated about AI, what has been created, understood, conceptualized, refused, rejected about AI, how uh, that affects then the society at, at large. Uh, and, and this would be then uh, as uh, in, in the religion and innovation conceptualization, these corresponded to um, uh, religion in innovation, the contribution of religion and innovation this, uh, in, in AI, this forms our um, corner of uh, religion in AI. And, and, the third, and the third corner is uh, as, as important, as essential, as a part of this three-dimensional um, um, figure, and that's the uh, AI uh, seen and lived and experienced and feared, uh, why not, as a per se a system of uh, belief, uh, as, as, as a possible religion. Uh, we are familiar, for instance, with attempts to uh, devise dataism, the religion of data, as a possible religion of our of our time, of course, this kind of uh, uh, the, the, these attempts can uh, have uh, uh, different meanings. Can be an intellectual exercise. Can be uh, more turned into uh, alerting about something which is seen as uh, dangerous. Uh, but the the, the 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 point is, at the end of the day that when we deal with AI, uh, there's an element of what we uh, deeply think about uh, AI, whether we uh, um, uh, understand that or not, or whether we accept that or not, whether we are aware of that or not, which, which is very important. And, and, and again, this can be sort of compatible. So it is, it is compatible to have a uh, religious uh, re religion-based uh, view of AI, which understands that AI also has some measure of belief involved as a possible, you know, compatibility between the two aspects. And on the opposite side, there can be a stark contrast, a, a sort of uh, fundamental competition between a true um, uh, religion or belief and AI seen as an alternative, a competitive, and therefore, a threatening um, a system of system of belief. I want to come back to that issue of, of uh, competition or alternative uh, a bit later on, but let, let's zero in on this issue of uh, AI in religion. Uh, one of the things that I found really helpful and interesting about the report is all the specific examples you gave of religious use of AI in, in a range of um, contexts all around the world. And I was glad that you hyperlinked a lot of those footnotes because I found myself clicking on them, going all over the web, all over the world, uh, looking at these really fascinating uh, examples. Um, I, I wonder for, for you in, in the research that you've done, are there particular examples of uh, religious use of AI that you find to be particularly innovative or curious or, or, or promising? Uh, well, uh, this is a difficult question, a, a very good one and a difficult one because um, because of one um, fu fundamental uh, issue of approach here. Because I think the challenge is to uh, take full notice of a field which is uh, amazingly open and evolving and dynamic. So uh, this very exercise of mapping 
is at a, at a, at a, at a, at a core of the challenge. And, and we need to be, um, to let ourselves be constantly surprised about what is, is, is out there. A lot of discussion with uh, the group um, while we were preparing this policy paper was really about what had already been established in literature. And we knew and we experienced that what had been uh, identified as, example, as an example of interaction of AI and religion was very unsatisfactory because it was based on pretty narrow conceptualization of that encounter already. So you mentioned before ethics. Very often, um, attempts to map the interaction of AI and, and religion are based on documents issued by religious organizations around uh, the uh, possible threats from AI of multiple, you know, um, of multiple kinds. Um, we've been trying to enlarge this, this mapping uh, as much as possible. So when you ask the question, in fact, what came to my mind is something which is, is apparently pretty marginal, is our um, engagement with Jehovah's Witnesses, which took uh, two different shapes. We had a, a workshop uh, uh, um, with some experts on Jehovah's Witnesses, some representatives of, Jehovah, the, of the congregation uh, itself, around the evolution of their websites, where we were also challenging uh, digital evolution. So beyond, beyond a website, how the website could be, um, uh, could be enhanced through um, uh, digital technologies and even possibly an AI. And, and, and during that workshop, we discussed the understanding of the Jehovah's Witnesses that their websites should be strictly one way only, one way only. So that would be the congregation um, putting content through the websites at the disposal of the viewers and not vice versa. And we discussed the assumptions of this. And I found this, this fascinating. And this uh, 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 comes down to something that needs to be a part of the conversation, which is rejection, objection from religious uh, actors. A, a, a even more fundamental than just uh, an ethical, you know, an ethical self-protective um, warning about uh, the possible threats of, of AI. This is something fundamental about how communication is built. And in the case of the Jehovah's Witnesses, there was a you know, wholesale rejection of something that in other contexts would be fundamental of the contemporary um, I, I, uh, ICT, which is, which is uh, co uh, highly connectivity which is you know, st staying connect, staying connected all, all the time. And, 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 and this is for me a good example precisely because apparently someone would not come it in in a mapping of AI religion. But in my opinion, it counts. And then second shape, we discussed um, in the preparation, uh, during the preparation of the document, we discussed the document with a scientist a, a, a member of the Jehovah's Witnesses himself. And he, um, and we, we even quoted uh, from him in a preliminary document, which was submitted to the EU commission. Uh, and, and in this quote, he says, you know, I'm a Jehovah's Witness. I work uh, with AI every day because that's, that's my area of expertise. That's my area of research. For me, there's a continuum between my faith and my work on AI. There's a continuum, that's what, so you see these two examples, they, um, th they come to my mind, it's a bit counterintuitive because they would, uh, you know, we might even discuss with you and with some colleagues whether they count as examples of AI, but for the sake of keeping the our, our minds and, and, and the field and this mapping as open as possible, I think that the best examples I can give. And, and from that mapping exercise, are there any patterns that emerge in terms of how uh, religious or theological differences uh, map onto different levels of comfort 
with uh, the use of AI in religious contexts? Do, do different conceptions of the divine, of nature, of the human body, do those lead to different um, kinds of usage um, with, uh, with artificial intelligence? Yeah, I think that the, the, the main pattern is um, the uh, still today a defensive pattern, which is perfectly understandable. I mean, I, I, I perfectly understand, especially organizations, to be concerned. Uh, this this uh, defensive pattern um, is again very much uh, connected to the ethical preoccupation. Now, the point is that we should try to formulate some criticism vis-a-vis -vis, um, the construction of a defensive posture uh, um, based on uh, an ethical discourse as amounting uh, to a comfort zone. And this, this is the risk for religious actors very, very often. Of course, they have very good reasons for being concerned uh, for themselves very often. They have very good reasons for being concerned for uh, other alternative religious actors uh, which abuse these technologies. Just think of uh, uh, extremist, violent abuse of digital technologies, which is of course of great concern. And, uh, and of course, they, uh, we, not only we, we need to understand, but we need to, to value and support uh, an ethical uh, approach in the sense of uh, religious individuals and organizations joining their voices to the voices who convey criticism of AI, as I mentioned, in many possible respects, including, you know, uh, uh, automated weapons, you know, um, which would be an extreme example of what uh, AI can uh, can turn out uh, to be. But um, having said this, and having identified this that I describe as as a, as a defensive pattern, as the mainstream pattern, then um, the, the most interesting aspect to observe is how then religious individuals and religions are also able to add something else, which would be their own approach to AI in many different ways, their own experiments to AI. So not just opposing a wrong use of AI, not just opposing abuse of AI, but also being a part uh, of a great effort of mankind to shape AI, to develop AI in the desirable direction. Well, let's talk about uh, re religious engagement for a moment. Uh, often that term is used in a fairly limited sense to mean uh, government outreach to religious groups, the government messaging uh, to religious groups. Uh, in the report and in your work more broadly, you use that term again more expansively. You have something much more uh, practical, much more interactive uh, in, in mind that I think has, has relevance far beyond the AI field. So how do you use uh, the, the term religious engagement or engagement with religious and belief actors? Yeah, our preference there is really uh, for associating engagement to concepts like uh, agency in particular, and even autonomy. Uh, we, uh, those who are familiar with free original belief, uh, know how uh, autonomy has emerged uh, in, the, in the recent uh, time as a key uh, uh, concept in, in, in this area. Um, our, our understanding is that engagement uh, should mean first and foremost promoting from inside and from outside the agency of religious individuals and, and communities. And, and therefore uh, mobilizing their autonomy and at the same time, in, to some extent, legitimizing their autonomy. Now, uh, this uh, happens according to the structure that we gave uh, to our policy document uh, in two main ways. We call partnership the first way and we call participation the second one. 
Uh, partnership refers to religious individuals and communities partnering with each other, partnering with uh, 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 governmental agencies, of course, but um, also, uh, and first of all, I would say partnering with all actors involved in the, in the development and deployment of, of AI. So this, is, this really refers to um, religious, uh, religious agency as a part of a larger uh, coalition, a, a larger effort aimed at uh, researching and developing AI. Uh, participation refers more to what um, religious actors can do to AI, can do with uh, AI. And this we are confronted with a, uh, with a task and a, and, and a challenge which is very similar to uh, the one of mapping I was uh, talking about before. Because this again is about seeing what's, what's out there. And this again was our struggle with, there's no literature because people don't, they, they, they're blind. People might be blind, I don't want to be, <laughs> people might be blind to the fact that that individual researcher belonging to the Jehovah's Witness is himself an example of engagement with AI. But I, I must say, to my knowledge, that there's very little openness and, and very much blindness, especially amongst the researchers, to this granular, a tiny dimension of engagement. Whereas, if we want to study what, what is happening at that level, we need to be granular and we need to be very comprehensive. So whenever and wherever an individual with a religion or belief is, is actually interacting with, a, with AI in a form or in another, at a stage or another research or development or you know, uh, technology transfer or very much, very much company, uh, the level of company work as well. So it could be a businessman. Well, whenever we have these examples, we have examples of engagement and we are very far from taking full notice of, of, of what is out there. And sometimes, sometimes religious people and even more religious organizations are themselves blind to uh, this uh, form of participation, according to our terminology, of religious actors in the making of AI. A lot of the engagement that you highlight in the report uh, focuses on Europe and, and much of the uh, engagement is e even convened by EU institutions. And that made me wonder as, as an American reader, if there are, um, a, if there's a unique uh, constellation of factors in Europe that make this religion and AI conversation easier to have than other regions of the world. You have um, a high degree of technological development where AI is a real pressing issue. You have a, a high degree of religious freedom long traditions of church state uh, collaboration. Uh, I'm wondering, and perhaps other factors, is, is there something distinctive about Europe that makes that conversation easier to have in Europe than, than other places? Well, on a maybe superficial level, I think that the factor triggering, uh, especially our work was the process of within the EU um, in view of the adoption of a strategy and then a policy, and even uh, in the end, also uh, regulatory uh, regulatory tools, and so and, and, and a legal framework. I think that this was done at a EU level through a um, vast uh, a pro, uh, to a process of of, of vast uh, consultation, and we were part of it as a part of uh, European European research. And I think that this process um, was uh, seminal in, in triggering our interest and the interest of, of others. Also because according to the EU infrastructure, this also activated the uh, dialogue between the EU commission 
and uh, religious and non religious actors, which is mandated by Article 17 of the Treaty on the functioning of the European Union. Um, now, uh, is this the full picture? I don't think so. I think that uh, Europe uh, and the European Union is a, a very interesting example of religious fluidity. So when I mentioned the definition of religion, uh, I was referring implicitly, uh, and first of all, to the European landscape, where in particular, you know, religion or belief as a social phenomenon, uh, the individual and uh, group's mobility, uh, the uh, emergence of the nones, the non-affiliated, the non-religious, the non-believers is, is impressive in terms of numbers. And uh, so I think that this peculiar religious landscape of, of Europe is of essence here. And I would include in this second ingredient, uh, the role of religious organizations, which might feel in Europe, particularly disconnected and therefore challenged and therefore, I would say mobilized vis-a-vis -vis precisely this disconnect between what they are supposed to represent and a reality on the ground, which seems pretty much uh, distant uh, from them. A third quick point is then blindness, because I think that um, if you um, think of our concern for opening our eyes vis-a-vis -vis the multiple ways in which this conversation is already out there without it being noticed very often, uh, well, then, of course, uh, the, the European context is, is a context where uh, religious is very often um, um, not uh, outspoken, not out there in society. And therefore, we, we felt that there was a particular need to emphasize what might, uh, again, go unnoticed because of this uh, secular-based uh, blindness. But of course, this can also be turned, as we, we try to do this, into an advantage, because then people might also be, um, uh, I would say, uh, available, ready to be surprised. So this does not mean that in our interaction with the EU Commission, people were distant or hostile, quite the contrary. Quite the contrary. And the fact that the European Union is, in fact, a context where a new um, conversation is possible. A final question for you, and that concerns the possible futures of this religion uh, AI uh, interplay. Uh, I'm wondering, as as uh, AI becomes more and more powerful, more and more sophisticated, more and more integrated into our lives, um, Will it present, in your view, a major challenge to traditional religious belief and, and institutions and rituals? You talked earlier about um, the religion of AI. Uh, AI is a possible competitor or, or, or alternative to religion. Uh, do you think it'll become a major um, uh, challenge or competitor? Will it have a secularizing impact even? Uh, or will it be uh, yet another technology like uh, radio, TV, the internet, uh, transportation technologies, and so on, that religious groups have, have simply leveraged for their own uh, religious purposes. Yeah, I think it's difficult to compare historically, but uh, for sure this new technology is going to affect uh, our world, including the world of religion or belief uh, in an extraordinary way. Um, now, um, this is why we insist on engagement as agency and autonomy, because uh, this more than a merely ethical approach, at least ethical approach in the defensive sense that I try to illustrate, uh, conveys and calls for responsibility. And this is what we really um, wanted to, to express in the document. It's a call for responsibility. Not that uh, religious individuals and, and actors are not responsible, but precisely because whenever they are responsible, this responsibility deserves to be acknowledged. 
And whenever this responsibility uh, needs from outside or from, or from inside to be reinforced, to be challenged and, and, and reinforced, well, again, um, this concept of engagement agency is, is, is very important. And AI is a, well, I, I would really say that in, in this case, uh, AI could be really seen as an ultimate test. Uh, at least in three dimensions. First, in the internal life, including liturgical life of the faith communities. So uh, I couldn't go too much into uh, in the details, but of course, when we think of you know experimenting uh, technologies, that's first of all through the everyday life of communities, which of course includes liturgies or charitable work or you know just gathering. Uh, just communicating uh, or or even the propaganda work. Um, the second dimension, I would say, again, is the participation in the public debates. So joining voices. So this sort of, you know, uh, how to, to how to keep a distinctive voice, uh, I suppose, for the sake of religious identities, while joining its its voice to others' voices in the public square. And third, I think that the, the challenge and the responsibility are particularly strong in the field of education and training. Education and training are, are very key uh, here. So that is how, how we see it at, 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 in the end. It's, it's, a, it's a great challenge to the responsibility of, of faith, uh, of faith uh, actors, religious, non-religious, religion or belief, however we conceptualize them. Uh, in the face of uh, constantly evolving technology. So there's, you know, the plasticity of religious or belief people and organizations uh, is really tested uh, with, with, with its fantastic potential by the plasticity of uh, ICT technologies, digital technologies, AI, as what we call today AI, we might call in a different way in two or three years uh, at a time. Well, Professor Ventura, thank you so much um, to you and to your colleagues for this excellent new report. And, and thank you so much for uh, joining me in conversation uh, today and sharing this, uh, sharing your insights with our, our viewership. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share for your brilliant questions.